Well, welcome to our service today. We're going to begin by turning in our hymnals to 375 or on the overheads. 375, since Jesus came into my heart. Let's please stand as we sing, then we remain standing for prayer. Bibles. We're going to read section starting in Acts chapter 2, verse 11. That would be Acts chapter 2, verse 11. Greeks and Arabians, we do not hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken unto my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is what which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Uh, let's look to the Lord in prayer at this time. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you for uh, welcoming us into this service today. We praise you because uh, you love each one of us and have a perfect plan for our lives. And Lord, we just thank you for the things that are being taught in the Sunday school hour. Lord, as we were in the men's class today, uh, talking about things like how your word is quick and powerful. 
And Lord, that it will actually cut into the very depth of our soul. And Lord, I pray today as the pastor gives out uh, the word from uh, your word, that Lord, it would uh, cut to our very uh, soul and spirit and into the joints and marrow that, Lord, uh, we would go away from this place and want to serve you with all of our heart, soul, and mind. We would uh, lift up uh, those in our congregation, which are several who have uh, lost uh, loved ones recently, and, Lord, uh, pray that this church would uh, bring comfort and peace to them. And, Lord, we uh, think about the many ministries as the choir will be uh, presenting in a few moments, and, Lord, as they'll be singing uh, about uh, things that are the, in truth of your word. Lord, we thank you for other ministries in this church. Uh, we've already mentioned the Sunday school hour, but Lord, we also think of the, the life groups and the Wednesday evening services. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to uh, bless the people that come. And Lord, that there would be those who might be hearing the gospel for the first time and, Lord, that they would accept you as their personal Lord and Savior. And Lord, I uh, pray, uh, too, for uh, the, the rest of this service. And, Lord, we just ask that you would uh, be working in each of our hearts, that you might draw us closer to you, to conform us into the image of your only begotten Son. Lord, we thank you that you uh, love us and want a personal relationship with us. We just praise you today for this service. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.
Good morning. I uh, just wanted to greet you this morning, say hello. Um, they have a couple announcements this morning. Uh, on April the 20th, which is next Friday, there is going to be the girls' night. Uh, any women uh, and girls are invited to come be a part of that. That'll be from 5.30 on, on April the 20th. Uh, they'll be going up to Sky Zone and having dinner. And so if you'd like to be a part of either of those things, the sign-up sheet is out in the lobby. And then on May 12th is the amazing race for the teens. Uh, we are still looking for some volunteers for that. So if you have May 12th available and you would like to help with the teen event on that day, uh, please come and talk to me. And then we have one more announcement with Bob Rossman. Uh, this announcement is actually in your bulletin, and it has to do with the security system that we're looking at. Uh, and the board has uh, approved this, but now it requires congregational approval. And this is for, uh, we contracted with this Bell security system and uh, we're gonna be putting like eight cameras around and they'll have video and ability to record things that go on around here. It's kind of the society we live in. Um, I wasn't gonna read the whole announcement to you because I'm having a little trouble seeing it. So <laughs> <laughs> eyes aren't what they used to be. But I'm assuming we'll probably have, it's not in here, I don't think, but uh, I'm assuming in about two weeks we'll probably have a congregational meeting to approve that.
birthday redeemer. Come on, guys. There is a redeemer, Jesus, our own son. Thank you, and please be seated. Fountain there. 
streams of living water, oh, wonderful and bountiful supply, oh, wonderful and bountiful supply. Let's have our ushers come forward, and while they're on the way, I wanted to say a special, very special thank you to each one who came yesterday. If you came to our work day and you stayed, you're a very special person. That shows me your heart was in it. Uh, some of the men actually went outside, and we tried to do the mulch in the 100% chance of rain, and it was 100% chance of rain. It fell. But uh, God was good and helped us get through it, and uh, aren't you grateful for this wonderful place that God's provided for us to meet together like this to worship? Well, I am. I'll say amen, okay? <laughs> Father, we love you this morning, and we are thankful that beyond this uh, wonderful place that you provided for us to worship you at a time like this, that there is a fountain that's flowing from Calvary, as the men just sang about, and hearts and lives are being touched and changed every single day as a result of it. And maybe in this room this morning, there's someone, Lord, who's never really opened up their heart to you. I pray their eyes would be open to your truth. They'd learn to repent of sin, put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Come now and bless this offering. Use it for your great and mighty purposes, we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalms 147 says, Hallelujah. How great is it to sing to our God. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the humble and casts down the wicked. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord, O Zion. May all who seek the Lord rejoice and be glad. And may those who love your salvation continually say, Great is the Lord. Please stand as we begin worship. The splendor of the King Oh 
is nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living Lord. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free, and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are one.
about a year ago, my wife and I were privileged to experience a dream come true. We got to go not only to Hawaii to celebrate our 30th anniversary, but on top of that, we got to go on a cruise while we were there. I've never showed you my slides before, and I'm not going to start this morning. <laughs> but I've got to tell you, it was far better than we ever thought or could dream. And I was reading this week about a man who saved up all of his hard-earned money to do that very thing, to go on a cruise. And since he spent all of his money to do this, he thought he would conserve his money by making peanut butter sandwiches to take with him on the cruise. And the first couple of days, things seemed to go okay with that, but after a while, he was passing the dining halls and noticing the buffets and people having fun. In fact, he even noticed waiters carrying food right to the very door of his neighbors. And so on the fourth day, he had enough of that, and he stopped one of the stewards, and he said, excuse me, but where do I go to purchase a ticket so I can enjoy a good meal around here? And the steward said to him, have you not heard? When you buy your ticket to board this cruise line, the meals are included. I read that this week thinking how many of God's people live beneath their divine privilege in Acts chapter 2. If you turn there with me, please, we're going to see the birthday of the church when the Holy Spirit was poured out. And I've got to tell you that Peter's life was transformed from this day forward. You remember how he's been stumbling and fumbling, just not making the, the connection. But I'm telling you, when the Spirit of God fell down in Acts chapter 2, his life made a 180. Now, as you can see, this is a lengthy, lengthy chapter. and I can't do it justice in one setting like this, just breezing through it. So the way I'm going to approach this is to have a look at how specifically the Holy Spirit impacted one man, and that man would be Peter. And I've got to tell you from start to finish, it is phenomenal what God did for Peter on the day of Pentecost. If you have a look at verse 1, the Bible says, When the day of Pentecost was fully, 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 fully come. Watch what happened. They were all with one accord in one place. We don't know if that was the upper room where Jesus knelt down and washed the disciples' feet. There's a possibility it could have been there. But it could have been some upper room in the temple. That's a possibility too. But wherever it was, there, was about, there were 120 people that were gathered there, praying, waiting for the Holy Spirit to descend. And it reminded me when I'm hearing all the things going on in Syria this week, how God is operating on a divine timetable. Verse 1 says, when the day of Pentecost was set, it finally arrived. It was complete. God went to work, fulfilling His promise, pouring out the Holy Spirit. I hope you can see this where you're setting. The feasts uh, were mentioned back in the book of Leviticus, especially chapter 23. There were seven total and the first four happened in spring. You remember Jesus was crucified on Passover. The next day there was the unleavened bread. And then first fruits was the resurrection. Fifty days after Christ arose from the grave, God dispatched His Holy Spirit as was prophesied and predicted even way back 835 years ago uh, before this occurred in the book of Joel. And you see, a farmer understands that once they've planted the crops, there's a long time there, the summer months. And I believe at any moment now, the trumpet is going to sound and the church is going to be raptured out of here. A couple of occasions this week, I stood in funerals, funeral homes, stood out at the cemetery near Arcadia. 
And I read that beautiful passage from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that for the believer there's hope. The trumpet of God will sound. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to be forever with the Lord. But I just want you to see in verse 1, God is right on schedule. The book of Ezekiel talks about there's coming a day when all of the enemies of Israel are going to be gathered in that spot over there near Syria. The Iranians, the Russians, the Chinese. And their sole desire is to eliminate Israel. And just when they think, think they've got Israel cornered, God's going to break out of the clouds and deal with them. So you can see it. If you have eyes to see it, you read your Bible, read the local paper, watch uh, Fox News, CNN. It's coming, and it could be today when Jesus Christ takes us home to be with him. Look at verse 2. Here's what happened on the day of Pentecost. Suddenly, there was something that you could hear, a sound from heaven like a rushing. Literally, my translation says mighty, but literally, there was a violent wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. Anyone, anyone ever seen or heard a tornado from Florida? Or been through a few hurricanes? Seen the destructive nature of a tornado? People who've been in tornadoes say that they hear this unusual sound like a freight train. I still remember when the tornado did such damage over in Van Wert. That Sunday evening, I was heading from our house over to the church. I saw clouds like I had not seen before. And learned the next day that it not only touched down in Van Wert, went right over top of us here and landed over in Faustoria somewhere. Something took place in that upper room that they would never forget. The descent of the Holy Spirit. They could hear it in verse 2. Look down at verse 3. Something now they can see. And they, there appeared unto them cloven tongues. And what was the description of these tongues? And by the way, that word in the Greek is the word glossa. We get the word glossary or vocabulary. So keep that in mind. But there was, it appeared unto them cloven, distributed tongues like of, as of fire. And it sat upon each one of them. Now let me ask you a simple question. When you mix wind with fire, what typically happens? Anybody from Southern California ever heard of the Santa Ana winds? There's something that happens that ignites those flames. That Basically, they just got to get out of the way. Because this is unstoppable. And essentially, that's what's happening in Acts chapter 2. So many of God's people are afraid of it. But you let the Spirit of God fall in a community like Arlington, Ohio. And God's people, their hearts are right with him. They're open to receive his word that we just sang about. And they're open to receive his spirit. I'm telling you, what's about to happen is something that is unstoppable, irresistible. As a matter of fact, the intervening verses in verses 5 through verse 11, there are 15 geographical locations that Luke mentions, the one who wrote this under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. There are about 240,000 people that have converged at Jerusalem. And they hear in their particular tongue, in their particular dialect. In fact, look at the end of verse 6 in my translation. It says language, their own language. That's the Greek word is dialect. Down in verse 8, same, same word. It's translated tongue in my Bible, but it's the word dialect. In other words, someone from the south comes up to the north. They speak funny, do they not? They've got that dialect going down there. When all these different nations, 15 of them are mentioned here, converged on Jerusalem. These followers of Christ, endowed by the Holy Spirit, had the capability of speaking right into their dialect. And what were they speaking? Look with me now at, the, at verse 11. Here are the last two remaining geographical places that he mentions, the Cretes and the Arabians. We do hear them speak in our glossa. The magnificent, the wonderful works of God. I'm telling you, if the Spirit of God falls in your life, in your church, this is what's going to happen to your community. They're going to sit up and pay attention that God is at work. He's moving, He's stirring, and, and quite frankly, in the quiet stillness of my week, God is convincing me more and more that he is unleashing his spirit in this place, Bible Fellowship Church. There are things that are happening that I cannot explain. They're God-like things. 
God irresistibly is moving and working. Well, what happened next in verse 12? They were all amazed and some were perplexed in verse 12, saying one to another, what in the world's going on around here? But others, and you won't like this part, but it, it's reality. When God unleashes his spirit, some people actually ridicule, mocking, said these men are full of new wine. But here we go, verse 14. I want to lock in on Peter, verse 14. Do you see his name mentioned there? And I just want to give you quickly, what are some practical, visible evidences that God is pouring out his spirit on your life or the life of his church? What are some actual, visible evidences? And the very first thing that touched me this week, the Lord showed me, is that Peter had incredible new boldness. Look at verse 14 with me. Peter stood up with the eleven, and he lifted up his voice, and he said to them, You men of Judah, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and listen to my words. This guy was a fisherman. He enjoyed being out in the Lake of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, just, just doing his thing, right? Fishing. You don't bother me, I won't bother you. But God's been working in his heart, in his life for three and a half years. And now Jesus has ascended back to heaven. God pours out his spirit on Peter. And what's the first thing right out of the gate he's characterized as having? He stands up. I like that boldness. He lifts up his voice. He says, ladies and gentlemen, listen to what I've got to tell you. And again, keep in mind, there were like 240 thousand people that were gathered in Jerusalem according to the context at this time I'm saying to you this morning that when you are saved and born again and God fills you with his Holy Spirit man there's a sudden boldness that wells up within you and you've just got to tell somebody excuse me I know you're busy but I got to tell you something <laughs> just been released from prison Something's happened to me even more exciting than winning the super jackpot lottery. But what is it? <laughs> Jesus has come. He's died for our sins. He's ascended back to heaven. He's just poured out his Holy Spirit. And he addressed people who were mocking. He addressed people who were bewildered. People, what in the world? And I got to tell you, again, I've been in funeral homes this week. And if eyes could speak in funeral homes, what they're saying to me is, well, is there somebody, anybody that could tell me the meaning of life? Is there anybody out there that knows how to get to heaven when they die? I mean, I live for that. I know some of the guys like to golf or go fishing or whatever. You put me in front of a group of people who want to know how to get to heaven, I, I, I come alive to that. Peter was bold. Had a great boldness he never had before. In fact, we're not going to do it. We could do it. But I just, I, I started going through the rest of the chapters here where Peter's mentioned. And in chapter 3, he goes down to the church, the temple. There's a, a lame man that's been laying there for quite some time. And he's begging, anybody got some alms for the poor, alms for the poor? And Peter, you know what he said. Silver and gold have I none, but I'll tell you what I do have. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. Woo! He gets up and walks. Now that'll make a church service exciting right there, right? And people were amazed by this. Where in the world is he getting this kind of power? He's just a former fisherman. Yes, but now he's been endowed by the Holy Spirit. Now he's got a confidence he's never had before. Let's just peek at it. Verse 12 of chapter 3. And when Peter saw it, he answered the people, You men of Israel, why are you marveling at this? Why are you looking at us so earnestly? As though by our own dunamis, our own power of holiness, we had made this man whole. No, this is all to the glory of God. Chapter 4. He gets thrown in jail over all this. The Sanhedrin showed up. Those are the big guys. Those are the guys from Washington, D.C., the government. And they convene a council, and you got the high priest going. And what are you doing, Peter? You need to calm down. But you notice chapter 4, verse 8, he's just as bold as ever. Next chapter 5, he confronts Ananias and Sapphira. They are in the church. They're engaging in hypocrisy. And Peter calls them out for it. I'm just telling you, I'm getting excited about this. Peter was like Superman all of a sudden. He had a confidence that he'd never had before. And I'm telling you, when you get born again, fill the Holy Spirit. Number one, it'll show up in your heart. There's a new confidence you never had before. I mean, I'm the guy that nearly fainted in my first 
speech class in college in Chattanooga, Tennessee. If anyone's ever heard of Dr. John R. Rice, his granddaughter was my speech teacher. They don't get more backwoodsy than me. I've got to tell you that, okay? I nearly fainted when she asked me to stand up publicly and, you know, just give us a little simple illustration of something. Uh, hello. You know, I'm just scared to death. But I do remember after becoming a believer in high school, witnessing to those around me. Where does that come from? It's not me. It's the Holy Spirit that's doing that. Let's go to the next one. In verses 16 through 17, notice the mention at the end of verse 16 of the name Joel. Again, 835 years before this account, Joel talked about God pouring out His Holy Spirit and what would happen as a result. As a matter of fact, in this prophecy, some things haven't happened yet. They're yet to remain. They're going to happen in the tribulation and beyond. But if you count the number of verses in this chapter that, ref that Peter is using here for his sermon, 22 verses and more than half are taken up with Old Testament prophecy from the prophets or David. He mentions David over and over and over. He must have really liked David. You know what this tells me about Peter once he's filled with the Holy Spirit? Not only does he have a new boldness, a new confidence in his heart he never had before, but secondly, he's got a conviction that God's word, whether it's from Genesis through Revelation, it is the word of God. God illuminated in his heart, in his mind, those passages which up to this time were rather vague for Brother Peter. But when the Holy Spirit came, it was like the Holy Spirit turned on switches inside of, of, of Peter. And he started seeing the connection between, oh, okay, Joel. And, oh, okay, what's happening right now? And, okay, what's going to happen in the future? Last birthday, not this birthday, January, but last birthday, January, anonymously, I still don't know who it is. If it was you, thank you very much. Somebody sent me a Christmas or a birthday card anonymously, didn't sign it. And they put in there a substantial gift. And they just said, Pastor, hope you have a happy birthday. I said, thank you. Don't know who to thank, but thank you. And I thought to myself, if you got this kind of money here, don't know what to do with it, what would you do with it? I went up to Walmart. I've always wanted one of these flashlights that'll knock somebody down when they start coming up the steps at night, you know? Because <laughs> I, I, I can't find my gun. If I can find it, I probably can't find the bullets to put in. But I, I grab my flashlight right, and knock them down with the flash. By the way, I do have a, a bat right beside my bed. So don't, don't try that sort of thing, okay? But anyway, you got to plug this thing into your computer and let it just charge and charge and charge. And I remember having it. After it was charged, I said, where is a dark place in our house where I could see how well this thing works? I know where. Upstairs, in our bathroom, there are no windows. I closed the door. I turned the flashlight on. And I started looking around our upstairs bathroom. And I saw cobwebs and dust <laughs> and things that I didn't know existed. <laughs> I, I had 5,000 lumens going. Brightened up the whole place. You know, when the Holy Spirit came into Peter's heart, the switch was flipped. He got more than 5,000 lumens. His heart was opened up to those Old Testament passages. God shed his light on the book of Joel. God shed his light on the book of David. And he could reach back and take those prophecies and say, you know, the reason you guys are missing this is because you don't understand that God is at work. If you had only known Joel's prophecy, you would have known you're witnessing a work of the Spirit, not a result of men being drunk. By the way, isn't that interesting? No, they thought they were drunk. Because Ephesians 5.18 says, be filled with the Spirit. And when you're filled with the Spirit, <laughs> don't be drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Who was it? Hannah in 1 Samuel went down to the temple and she began to pray for a child. Oh God, we live in a desperate hour. Give me a godly seed. And the high priest thought she was drunk. No, she's not drunk. She knows something about interceding for God, for, a, for a, a godly child. Here's one other thought before we move on. In Luke chapter 24, the last chapter of Luke's gospel, the day of the resurrection, Jesus went on a journey seven miles with two Emmaus disciples. And they walked from here probably over toward Corey, Ohio. And as they walked along, 
Jesus came in their midst. And he started flipping switches about the Old Testament. From Genesis through Malachi. He started talking about himself. Tying in the scriptures with the Messiah. And it says in Luke 24, 32. They said one to another. Didn't our hearts burn within us while he was talking with us, by the way. And while he was opening to us the Holy Scriptures. The second evidence that God is pouring out his spirit on an individual or on a church. Is that you will have a conviction that the Bible is the word of God. From our friends and answers in Genesis. We're told in 2 Timothy chapter 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for four areas of your life. Number one, doctrine to teach you what is right. Number two, reproof teaching you when you're not right, when you're out of step. Number three, how to get right. That word is very powerful. Their correction is the idea of someone taking and setting a, bro a broken bone. And then how to stay right, instruction in righteousness. That's the Peter now that he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Conviction that God's word is his word and uh, now he's able to make sense of it all the next thing we want to talk about look at verses 21 and this actually the end of the the sermon here but it says in verse 21 in light of joel's prophecy it's going to come to pass that whosoever calls on the name of the lord shall be saved and you men of israel verse 22 hear these words jesus of nazareth a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken him by wicked hands, you have crucified and slain him. I think the best way I can develop this, what's happening here, is if you've ever gone to the top of a mountain and looked back down, and you get a whole different perspective when you're up there. I mentioned our cruise a while ago. The first day we left Honolulu, we went to a place called Maui. What a beautiful island. And this huge, huge, huge ship that we were on came in to an industrial area. We kind of stuck out like a sore thumb. That day, my wife and I rode over to a place called Lahaina, which is a popular tourist resort. It was so beautiful, crystal clear water. But the next day, my wife got to do what she wanted to do. And the day after that, I got to do what I wanted to do. She wanted to ride bikes from the top of this mountain here. Uh, how does it go again? It's hard to pronounce. Hali Akala, anyone ever heard of that? Fortunately, it's a dormant volcano. This van that we jumped in, about 17 of us, took us up to this high, high, high mountain, about 10,000 feet up. And we put on helmets, and hopefully your brakes work really good on downhill, right? And we just had a blast. And uh, by the way, the next day, my wife and I got to ride on scooters for about 25 miles along, uh, uh, what's the place where they make coffee in Hawaii? Kona. Kona. Thank you. Uh, so that was what I got to do. We got to do together. It was fun. But what I want to say is when we went up to the top of this mountain here, just before we came down, our ship got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And the island just opened up. It was a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place. And I noticed going through here that Peter, he starts out with Jesus of Nazareth. We just read that in verse 22. But as he builds into this chapter and into the next chapter, his view of Jesus Christ, who he really is, gets greater and greater and greater and greater. Watch how this works. He starts off Jesus of Nazareth, just a mere man. Lord and Christ, chapter 2, verse 36. His son Jesus, chapter 3, verse 13. The holy and the just one in chapter 3, verse 14. And finally, in chapter 3, verse 15, he is the one who gives life. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, saw who Jesus is in a whole new light. But he also said, saw what Jesus did, the work that Jesus did in a new light. Now let's go back to verse 21. That word saved at the end of verse 21 in the King James is the word sozo in the Greek. It's the word to rescue out of danger. Peter saw Jesus Christ as the only means of man's salvation or redemption. The word redemption literally means to go in and to buy out of a slave market. 
But notice the next word in chapter 2, verse 33. It says, therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted, he's now ascended back to glory, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he shed forth this, which you now see and hear. What does regeneration mean? Generation. If you have a, a broken bone, God wants to reset you and restore you and regenerate you, give you brand new life. And included in that is the pouring out of His Holy Spirit upon you. And finally, way at the end of the chapter, He talks about this remission of sin. In verse 38, Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the, literally, for the forgiveness or the cancellation, the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Don't make this complicated or difficult. God is in the business of buying us out of the slave market of sin and regenerating us by putting His Holy Spirit into us once we're cleansed and forgiven and our sin has been canceled under the blood of Jesus Christ. There's clarity about who Jesus is and about His finished work and His death, burial, resurrection, His ascension back to heaven. But I want you to notice now what happens here at the end of this chapter. This really touches my heart. In verse 41, it says, And they, gladly, they that gladly, literally welcomed his word, they were baptized in the same day. They were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Look carefully at that word added. It's used again down in verse 47, added, the Lord added to the church. It is a word that we get the word prosthetics, which is a strong word which means to be joined to. Now think about that for a moment. Not only once they were saved, the Holy Spirit came into them and they were baptized into the body of Christ, but physically, literally, they were baptized to identify with the local followers of Christ. And, but then it says that they were added to the church. And I'm pointing this out, dragging my feet over it, because there's some people who want to raise their hand and say, Pastor, show me in God's Word, the Bible, where it tells me I must join the local church. And this is about as close as you will find it right here. When the church was on fire, the Holy Spirit just fell. Not only were people properly, scripturally baptized, but they started joining the local church and this church was on fire they were magnifying the name of Jesus they were unified together in unity and they were just multiplying all over the place notice verse 42 and they confirmed they continued rather steadfastly in the apostles doctrine fellowship breaking of bread and in prayers in other words folks they had committed and they were all in they were sold out followers of Jesus Christ again when the Holy Spirit fell they had confidence, a conviction, a clarity, and there were conversions of lost souls. Three weeks ago, this past Friday, probably didn't hear much about this in the news, but over in the southern part of France, there was a gentleman who was in the military over there, and he's part of a law enforcement elite law enforcement and he was on duty when this terrorist broke into what we would call a grocery store over here and the terrorist had already killed somebody in a carjacking incident and killed two people in the grocery store and so they knew he meant business and the terrorist managed to capture the lady at the cash register who was 40 years old. Naturally, she's pleading for her life. This man went above and beyond the call of duty. He walked into the front door over to where that lady was being held captive. His name is Arnaud Beltrame. And the article that I read about him said he gives a life lesson in self-sacrificing love. The terrorist grabbed this man, let the cashier go free. And later on, the terrorist took this man's life 
He's just been married for a short time, 44 years old. And now he's being hailed in France as a national hero. A friend of his said, I'm not surprised because he lived a genuine conversion. The pastor where he went to church said, only faith like this can explain the madness of his sacrifice. And I couldn't help but think about that situation when I'm reading the end of Acts chapter 2. When the church was on fire, one word keeps coming to my mind over and over and over and over again. Those folks were really dedicated. They were committed. And I want to ask you this morning, has the Holy Spirit impacted your life that way? Is there a new confidence that wells up within you you've never had before? Is there a conviction from Genesis to Revelation that God's word is God's word? Is there a clarity about who Jesus is and about the finished work that he's accomplished for you on Calvary? And finally, are people's lives being changed as a result of your life in this community? Because you're now endowed by the Holy Spirit and you've sold out completely to him. I want us to bow our heads and close our eyes. And if you've never for yourself repented from your sin and asked the Lord Jesus to be your Savior, I'm going to ask you to take care of that this morning in this service. And then in the invitation, I'd like to have you come forward and take me by the hand and let me know that you've made that uh, confession of faith and you'd like to go public. You'd like to identify with the people of God. As I started out with this morning, this passage, there's so many things going on. It'd take us a couple of weeks to work our way through it verse by verse. But I wanted you to see how God changed the life of Peter. And he'll continue to change him as you work your way through the book of Acts. He's mentioned in the first 15 chapters. But after that, Peter would be executed. Why? Because he's all in. He's sold out to Jesus Christ. Are you sold out to Jesus Christ this morning? Or have you gotten to a place where you've settled down and you've lost your first love? If you're not born again this morning, why don't you come to know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? If you know him in salvation, maybe just a visit to the altar here this morning would be in store for you. Father, thank you so much for your word. And thank you that we are living at the tail end of church history. We look over our shoulder and we've got a 2020 vision of what you've done. Help us, Father, not to settle down and get lukewarm, but to experience the same power, to enjoy our same privileges that the early apostles experienced in Acts chapter 2. Do that great work in our midst today, we ask and pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need it on page 57 in your hymn book, the title of that hymn is Cleanse Me and it asks God to search us and know our hearts, try us and know our thoughts and see if there's any wicked way in us. If God's spoken to your heart, let's do something about it during this invitation. Would you stand with me please as we sing? Search me, O God, and know
very much. You may be seated. We're going to experience, uh, witness the believer's baptism this morning. If you would, take your hymnals and we'll turn to hymn number 324, please. 324. Or it is on the overhead as well. It is glory just to walk with them whose blood has ransomed me. It is rapture for my soul each day. It is joy to lie to fill me near wherever my friends may be. Blessed is glory all the way. It is glory just to walk with him. It is glory just to walk with him. He will guide my steps. Part of the evidence that God is at work here in our midst is standing before you this morning, and I'm going to let Bob come and share with you what the Lord did for him this week. So, um, <clears throat> am I talking loud enough? Okay. Um, I'd like to give like a five-minute testimony, and. Um, over the last three days, I've thought about what I should say today and uh, thought a lot of good things, and I've forgotten most of them. <laughs> but uh, so, um, but I, <clears throat> I believe it's God wants me to say these things. So it's important, I believe. So, um, <clears throat> so, um, I, 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 one thing I thought of was there's two men here about the same age, and at 17, Pastor heard the call and didn't look back. Whereas I heard the call <clears throat> and then um, I turned away for a, a good portion of my life my mother is here with us in the church today and um, she had me baptized and my mom and dad took me to church um, tried to give me their values I remember my mom encouraging me to go to Koinonia and youth groups um, and then and then I married Lori and um, she didn't know what she was getting into, but um, she's a wonderful woman. <clears throat> um, so all my life I've been in church, but the majority of it I was just pretending or not paying attention. 
just being uh, uh, God was not at work in my life and and so it took me down a, a dark path and uh, caused a lot of pain in Lori and my family so about I'll break here I something I thought I wanted to say <clears throat> pastor talking about this church I want to say what this church means to Lori and I <clears throat> we came here a year ago and we, we thought we were leaving our other church for one reason but when we got here we found out no this is where God thought we were ready for this church now uh, like going from high school to college and uh, so the people in the small groups, pastors, sermons, uh, Sunday school, the men in the, the men in the small groups. It's, um, it's through your example that Lori and I have grown so much over the last year. So um, about 15 years ago, God did a major change in my life. But I believe. My heart was so hardened over that that it took a long time, and so it may it's been 15 years now, and um, I believe God has softened my heart enough uh, for this. Um, so, Lori was baptized a month ago or so. And I thought I should do that too, but I didn't know, didn't know if I was ready. So I wanted to talk to pastor. And so we did that on Friday and he encouraged me to do it. So that so Friday in my garage, we knelt down and uh, I recommitted my life to Christ. Uh, I've, uh, <clears throat> I've, I've been like the double-minded man in James for most of my life, and now that I, that I want to stop, I want to be all in and no looking back, and, and I feel that. to say something about Lori it's it's her faith and her strength that uh, her strength through God that uh, this that this isn't a bad story this is a happy story this is a happy day <clears throat> in my life Bob has been a friend of mine for many years, and I've told him over those years how much I respect and appreciate him as a, as a friend, and I take great delight in being able to pray with him to make sure he knows Christ as personal Lord and Savior. I know when we ask, I ask him if he would kneel down here at his bench in his garage, he said, well, the house is a little cleaner. Can we go in there? And I said, no, let's just do it right here. And I knelt down on one knee. I'm of little faith. I looked over and Bob was on both knees. He was serious about this. And so then I got on my knees as well and we just prayed right there in front of his workbench and he asked the Lord Jesus to be his savior. And now, as you can see, he wants to follow him in believer's baptism. So Bob... I love you, man, and based upon your profession of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and out of obedience to his divine command, I'm now baptizing you, my brother, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You're now buried in baptism, and you are raised to walk in newness of life. Let's stand together, please, and don't forget tonight at 6 o'clock, if you're not part of a small life group, man, you're missing it. We're, I'm hearing so many good things about our life groups.
Father, again, we praise you. We stand in awe of you, and we sense a touch of your presence as we looked at in the book of Acts, chapter 2. You're, you're working just as much today as you were then. I just pray you'd help us to be in tune with what you're doing. I pray especially for Bob, Lord, that you'd help him now to grow in your grace and knowledge and to be mightily used for your great purposes. We love you. Thank you for the time we've had together this morning. Give us a good restful afternoon. and pray you'd help us as we come back again this evening to learn more of who you are, what you've done on our behalf. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.